meeting is being recorded. Hi, everyone. My name's uh, Lori. I'm the manager of the Seniors Resource Center. And welcome to our Senior Center Without Walls series. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that my chosen residents are living in, and this Zoom meeting is coming to you from, the, ter the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. I'd like to specifically acknowledge the territory of our neighbors at Sianu First Nation and to express appreciation for the good relationships that are being built between neighboring communities. Today, our event is how to prepare your home for aging in place. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Um, this event is being recorded and we're gonna post it on the Machosan Seniors YouTube channel. And I'll just ask that you keep your microphones muted unless you have a question. There'll be uh, three presentations, then time for questions and or sharing your own experiences. And we have a great panel of speakers today, uh, Tanya Fox of Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists. We have El Santos of Next Day Access and the chosen resident, Rachel French de Mejia, who's actually in Hawaii today joining us and each um, of our presenters are going to share their experience and expertise on this topic and we're going to start with um, Tanya who works um, as the regional director for the BC chapter of the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists. Tanya also works as an occupational therapist through her own practice called Design Ability. Design ability focus on assessing the environments the individual lives in to help make changes that enable them to function at their very best, no matter what changes they may have experienced. Using an OTI ensures that recommendations for adapting the living spaces or helping or helpful equipment will last into the future for the client's needs. Uh, she has also started her PhD where she's studying how to better help people remain in their homes throughout their lives through home modifications and policy changes. So over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much. I will just get my screen sharing here so you guys can see what we're doing. Let's get it going. There we go. Okay, so thanks, Lori, um, for that introduction. So as you all heard, my name is Tanya Fox, and I'm an OT, primarily coming to talk to you today, or an occupational therapist um, is the long way. Um, so I'm going to assume that some of you may have worked with an OT before, but that many have not. So I'll give just a quick rundown of what an OT in general is. So we're not about work or our occupations in that way of thinking about it. Um, the word occupations from occupational therapy came about from about 100 years ago when the um, career started. And what we now know um, was uh, when the soldiers were coming home with what we now know as PTSD. So um, it was a bunch of nurses at the time that kind of branched off and started realizing that if they had things to do to help the soldiers occupy their time, they had better outcomes in adjusting back to life back home here. Uh, and then off occupational therapy went using all of these daily activities to occupy your time or provide the therapy for. So that's where it started from. So our roots are really um, in what do people want to have to like do, um, enjoy doing in all of their daily lives. And, and then that is where we look at to try to either maximize their ability to keep doing it or uh, find new ones to help still give a good quality of life regardless of what's going on for people. So now we largely work in rehabilitation. Um, and then, so 
typical easy examples are after um, a stroke or spinal cord injury. If you've lost the ability to use part of your body, a physio will come in and try to figure out how do we make that part of your body work again. The OT will come in and say, well, what can't you do because it's not working quite right? And how can we get you to be able to do those things again? So that's just a nice little easy example to kind of get you guys oriented to what how my brain works. So as we start our time here together, I'd like you to think about if you've ever had a time where you couldn't do what you wanted, need to do, or have to do, whether that was temporary or something permanent that you needed to adjust to. Um, if anybody right now is having a hard time just doing the things the way that they used to, so you can still do it, but it's changed a little bit. Um, if there's anybody here who's living with someone who has a hard time doing what they used to, and sometimes they notice, but sometimes they might not. Um, and also thinking about who here wants to be able to stay living in your home of choice versus having to move somewhere else as your needs change. So as we move through today, we'll talk about um, aging in place, who the professionals are to help you stay living there, um, and what living in place looks like and how, and then I'll hopefully leave you with some resources to help you at the end. Um, so aging in place has been the buzzword used in the media, and this is typically referring to helping people remain at home as they age instead of having to downsize into a condo or move into a home or long-term care facility. We'll talk today about how I think the term aging in place doesn't apply to what we all need to think about to make our homes work for all stages of our lives. I prefer the idea of helping people fully live their lives in place or living in place. This doesn't just apply to us when we're aged. Um, I'll help you understand the basics of who can help you stay living in place now and into the future. And then we'll talk about the different ways that living in place can look for different stages of life and the reasons for thinking about your environment. So for living in place, COVID really brought about uh, these discussions much more in the forefront um, about where we can live safely into our older years. And it really zapped it into the forefront of our minds with all of the images coming out of the media and hearing stories of people living in facilities and being locked in without social contact. At its worst, people dying in these facilities in um, up to large numbers to kind of it really was a very vivid example to help us maybe start to wrap our heads around what are some of the other options here? A dramatic option or a dramatic image, obviously. Um, so from a recent survey though, we do know that 81% of seniors in Canada today want to delay institutionalization as long as possible. 78% of Canadians in general say they wanna remain in their homes as they age. And as an aside, approximately 60% of Canadians identify themselves as having a disability. And these are also people that want to live in place. Sometimes our health may determine that at some point we may have to have health care accessible to us 24 hours a day. It's not super common, but until that time, it's not necessary to leave our home if you don't want to. In fact, at least one in nine residents of care homes in Canada could live at home if their home was modified to suit their needs and then return home. So there are many options that can help you remain in your home as you move through life. As I mentioned in our intro, aging in place is the term that is out there when talking about staying in our homes. I think this makes us all think about this issue too late in life. So focusing only on it when we're starting to really accept that we're aging. And I would argue that some of us don't start to accept that until well into our 80s or 90s even, is if we're living well into our older years. To be able to have the health, social supports and services, we need to live safely and independently in our homes as long as we want to. And that starts earlier than aging would make most of us think. So for example, I'm in my 40s now and I can tell you I live much differently than I did in my first tiny condo in my 20s and I've made the adaptations along the way. If we could normalize that those adaptations just need to happen through the lifespan for as you change, I think people would be more willing to make the changes as you go rather than not realizing it until it's perhaps too late. So this thing, we're living our daily lives all through um, our lifespan and it includes all the things we have to do in our lives, how we make our coffee, use the bathroom, visit with our neighbors, walk our dogs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we need to look at how we're doing that in our environments as we go. 
One of the biggest tricks is working out when to start making the changes. So two tricks with this are that humans are resilient animals. We all know we're aging, but tend not to make changes to our behaviors at the same pace as our ability in functioning changes. And then we're all younger than, we all think we're younger than we actually are. Most of us don't notice until we have started falling, running into furniture. The worst examples I've seen often involve a trip over a rug, just a simple little throw rug that can break a hip um, or a slip in the bathroom and can end up sending you into the hospitals and worst case scenario, having to remain in facility, depending on what can be adapted at the back end. Um, we also really adapt or adapt really easily to keep things the way they've always been. So we see this with people who haven't been able to get into their tub for years. They've just given up bathing. Um, and you come in to do a home assessment with them and, and can help them realize that, no, you don't have to work around that big, chunky hole in your bathroom. We can make it work for you. So who can help you with this process? I think it's a team sport. So uh, occupational therapists um, have been doing this forever with people with disabilities or changed abilities um, related to illness or aging. And we're regulated health professionals. So just under the, all the same health acts as doctors and nurses and, and all the other health professionals in that area. And we're particularly skilled at helping you figure out how to live your life as fully as possible, regardless of how you're functioning. So our training is focused on completing thorough assessments of the person and their environment to work out how to best support their ability to participate in their activities in that environment. We work across the lifespan, so in schools, hospitals, communities, public, private, and our job is to help people either regain function when they've lost it, maintain it so you don't lose it, or prevent something from happening that can take function away. And in this area, OTs are very strong at understanding everything you bring to the table. So your medical history and diagnosis, your strengths, your challenges, and how those interact with the environment around you. So we make sure we're looking at all of the things in your environment, not just the tub. So thinking about who are the people in your life, anything else that matters very much to you that makes your life yours. Once an OT assessment has then helped you work out what your needs are in detail, and focused on your individual life and everything it has in it, you can work to build a team around that um, assessment results um, to build a team as you need. So for example, I think if we're doing a full on reno, then we probably need a lot of the people on this list. So um, contractors uh, or health equipment vendors work really well with occupational therapists to help make sure the right changes in equipment are getting done at the right time. Sometimes on huge scale projects, you need some architects involved. Designers are getting more and more into the, these kinds of teams when you're doing a full scale reno to make sure that it, it looks pretty and there are different considerations made um, depending on design that can improve accessibility as well. Um, and you wanna make sure um, that you also are thinking about the other parts of it. So financial planners or healthcare companies like um, the, you know, the nursing companies that will come out to the home for you and maybe help with cleaning. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, nursing that you have to have in the home to help you be able to stay at home. My slide will not skip. Now it'll skip 12, I bet. One sec here. Hmm. I'm having slide issues. Bear with me here. One second. Okay, there we go. So um, what it looks like is an OT comes into your home. Um, and takes a look at all of those things. Like I said, we want to hear about all the things um, that are difficult for you for sure. So all of the, those hints we're going to probe at, or like I talked about earlier, where are you having falls? Are you bumping into things? If you live with someone, we're probably going to get them to rat you out a little bit um, so that we can start to build a whole picture of what is going on for you right now. But then I think the piece that we bring as the medical professionals that we are is we can take on the weight of understanding how that may look 
five, 10, 15 years into the future and have a, a sense of what that crystal ball could look like so that when we make the change now, it's going to adapt for the long run. Um, ideally, we'll, if I feel like if we can do a really good job at the front end, you will be able to continue living in place in the space that you're in without running up against um, very many, if any more of those kinds of barriers in the future. We should, we should be future proofing any changes that come with your function so that you can just enjoy living out however long you wanna live in the place that we adapt for you. So we look at all of the physical, cognitive, what your emotional and social looks like, all of it um, to get the best idea of how a plan can change. So um, fixes can be as simple as a grab rail all the way up to major renovations or putting additions onto the home, um, redoing bathrooms, even just, you know, if at this exact point in time, the best thing for you is we just get rid of your throw rugs, then we can start small like that and then have the plan lay out into the future. So we can also help pick everything apart with where you're at right now and piece it out so that you don't have to do it all at once, but we can teach you when the flags are to take the next step um, and help you really maintain that control and independence over what it's gonna look like into your future. Um, these assessments are usually pretty hands-on. We wanna see you do the things um, because then that helps us get a good, clear understanding of what's going on. Um, and usually with these assessments, what I have seen over time is it really can save you money so you don't have to re-renovate down the line and you can get everything that you need and nothing that you don't. So some in some um, versions of, of stories that I've heard, you can have someone come in and rebuild everything to accessible code, but if it isn't designed and geared towards your individual needs, it's, it's um, needs to be readjusted anyways, and people end up having to spend more money. Um, so we can really help you focus on that functional piece and stay out of construction and renovation and everything until that's what we have to do. And then you bring in the team um, to help you get that job done. Um, so obviously most many people, I'm sure most of you who've joined us today um, are already kind of thinking about what home assessments could mean for them and, and have some value in thinking about it. But just to take a couple minutes to acknowledge that um, these home assess assessments to help you support living in place. From research, we know that neighbors, family, and even pets rank as, as fairly high indicators of um, perspectives of quality of your daily life. And the value of these essential parts of our daily lives can't be stated in dollars. I think we all know if for these pieces that we have that are important to us, we need them for as long as possible into our lives. And these assessments, with especially with an occupational therapist involved, will take of what all of those soft um, quality of life indicators are for you and really try to maximize them as best as we can. So these are just some of the quick versions of adaptations that can be done or considered. So bathrooms, um, accessible bathrooms to me are an absolute must. When I first started as an OT, I worked on the spinal cord injury unit at um, Vancouver General and little new grad me was shocked that the majority of people that we saw on the spinal cord injury unit were older adults who had fallen in their bathrooms. And I remember that's the seed that started where I realized that the bathroom is actually a very dangerous place um, and, and accessibility there needs to be prioritized um, ahead of most places in the home. Um, the kitchen, that can be anything from doing the full redo and having the roll under counter if you're using a wheelchair, changing counters to be specific heights, the whole nine yards, or the more common one I see for people, especially as they're, they're starting to change in how much they're cooking or, or how much they want to cook uh, in the kitchen, is re-look at your shelves. So pull everything out of your cupboards, and put them back in place in a way that it's the priority things that are in the easiest to grab spots. And this is something we all just live with how our kitchen is set up. And sometimes it helps to even phone a friend and, and just rip your cupboards apart and then put them back together in a new way that makes sense. 
Um, obviously, entries and doorways can be major barriers. So taking a look at them and thinking about just make them 32 inches. If you have the chance, you're doing some kind of little reno, widen those doorways while you're at it. Um, and then lighting and color can be important. So and, and inexpensive to kind of help um, make a space a little bit safer and more accessible. And obviously declutter and de hazard. So really take a fresh look around your place at are there things that you're bumping into? Can they be moved? Throw rugs um, as much as we all kind of love the warm up and cozy of them. If you're starting to catch on them, get rid of them. Um, changes in level in your home, get rid of them if you can. And so last but not least, we'll wrap it up quick here so we can get on to Al. I just wanted to leave you with some resources that can help because this is, this is a very quick version of what can be done for you. Um, in BC, we do have this Raha program and you can just go Google BC Raha program, which can provide some rebates um, depending on income levels and, and that kind of thing uh, towards renovations to help you remain in home. The Government of Canada, I've given you a couple of um, checklists and tax, dedu tax deduction programs. If you go search um, literally on the Government of Canada website, I gave you these words to go put in the search bar. Um, the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists, we have some information on aging in place. And again, that's just the search terms there for you. Um, and then same with Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. They have a couple of documents with some more information in them as well. Um, and if you need to find an OT um, or have any other questions, you can go to um, www.caot.ca and use the find an OT button. Um, and then you can put in where you live and, and what kind of help you're looking for to, to call and see if you can get some help. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Thanks so you much. Go. Tanya, that was awesome. So informative. And I will take those resources and add them to our website along with the um, along with the video recording. And uh, we we'll just hold your questions till the end because we're going to have Al come up next. And El Santos um, was an advanced care paramedic practitioner and educator and manager for close to 30 years and most of those years in different parts of Ontario. Elle also spent five years running a paramedic program in the Middle East and Qatar for the College of the North Atlantic as part of the Canadian initiative to bring programs to that country. As a healthcare a uh, pre-hospital provider, Al, has often seen many patients struggling to stay in their homes due to lack of accessibility or injuries associated with not having their home safely modified for their individual needs. And having been privileged to have a career serving and helping many individuals uh, throughout the years and wanting to return to BC, where he originally grew up, Al decided uh, two years ago to purchase a new franchise on the island with next day access, um, as it was a perfect fit to continue helping those in need to enjoy the comfort and safety of their home. So with that, I'm going to ask Al to uh, give um, his presentation. Welcome, Al. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and I'm very honored to be invited. Um, you know, listening to uh, Tanya is just it, so, so many times we get calls and it's so, um, I wish people understood the importance of having an overall uh, plan and understanding what they need. A lot of times I just get the call, I, I want a stair lift because my uh, neighbor has one, that kind of thing, but they don't realize exactly what uh, Tani was talking about, about the safety of, of the home and some of the, the barriers and those things. And, you know, um, I wish, we could work a little closer at times because I do think, you know, people just aren't even aware of some of the basics. Um, my area of expertise, if you want to call it that, I mean, I was a paramedic for a lot more years than I've been doing this. Uh, but the nice thing about a franchise is it, it, it does provide you a, a fast track in terms of education and certifications and getting to know stuff. So in terms of the industry and what, uh, uh, some of the things that exist that can help people, 
um, that's going to be basically my presentation today. We're going to talk a little bit about different pieces of equipment, some, some of those things. But holistically, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of sort of understanding, you know, that a stair lift does not fix everything. Um, you know, a certain piece of equipment doesn't resolve everything. So it's very, very important um, for the, you know, for individuals to, to, to be aware of that. So I'll get started. Can you see my screen okay here? Um, no problems? Yeah, I can see it. Perfect. All right. So I, I'm going to take a different approach here. Being in business, you know, we always uh, want to know what's what our competitors are doing and, and some of the, the other um, agencies out there and whatnot. I'm a firm believer in teamwork and understanding that what one organization does in the industry impacts everybody else. And it's important to understand that we're not necessarily perfect in every way, although I like to say so at times to my staff, but the, the reality is um, there are a lot of good companies. On the island here, we have a lot of different companies, some specialized in scooters, some uh, medical equipment. So there's a different array. Um, you have big chains like HME, Island, uh, Medequip is not, it's, it's basically the island, but Motion and HME are two big companies that are national brands that uh, basically provide a lot of uh, the same services that we do at Next Day Access. Having said that, I'm going to talk a little bit about our strengths and, and what we do, and then talk about those, those pieces of equipment that I talked about before. Okay. So Next Day Access uh, started um, uh, a few years back, um, I'll show you shortly uh, a, a little sequence of, of time frames, but it basically started with one individual in the States, um, and he's the um, president of American Access, which is uh, basically an aluminum building ramp company. And he basically started by, by providing that. They're the second biggest manufacturer in the States. And obviously being in that industry, he realized pretty quickly that um, he could be doing more, not just offering ramps, but offering other products because clients were calling him for, for information on those, on those items. Um, myself, I'm actually the second uh, franchisee in Canada. The first one started in uh, Oakville, Toronto area there. Um, and I, two years ago, uh, started the journey and, um, and, and set up uh, the franchise here. Since then, um, I have a, a peer in Vancouver who also uh, runs uh, greater uh, Vancouver region. And there's uh, right now there's, there's, I think three or four um, locations in Canada ready to open. So it's, it's going to be a big um, franchise. It's certainly big in the States, but in Canada uh, it's expanding now and we're going in that direction. Um, I tend to think that we're a, a bunch of caring professionals that, that, are in this business for the right reasons. Our intent is to provide um, equipment and help people stay in their homes and stay safe. And that's, you know, our, our technicians are trained um, by the manufacturers. They're, um, they become specialized in certain types of products. And that's, that's sort of our approach because the reality is there's so much out there. There's so many different manufacturers for stair lifts, for example, for other products. So there's a lot of things out there. Some of them not so good, some of them excellent products, but costly. So it's, it's all about balancing and trying to provide uh, access to, um, to the right piece of equipment for, for those individuals. And our motto, uh, you know, the company was started as Next Day Access and it was named that for a reason. Um, I often get calls here in the office from a family mem member panicking because all of a sudden, you know, uh, their spouse fell, broke a hip, been in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and now they're going to be released and, and they're just not set up. And so, um, you know, they need something to, to get them into the house. They need something to, to move them within the house. Um, some of them are rehab, you know, temporary situations. Some of them are long term and their prognosis isn't very good in terms of, of outcomes. So, uh, you know, different needs, different situations. Our intent is to try and provide some of the basics next day. Now, obviously we prioritize and, and, and we can't do that for every single client. Otherwise, you know, we, we'd have to be uh, way bigger than we are. And we're basically a small company and that's our niche. Our, our intent here is to provide quality and good products at a, at a reasonable cost. 
these are the franchise locations in the states as of 2022. Um, and you'll see me down there, uh, third from the bottom there. Vancouver opened up, and there's uh, other U.S.-based uh, locations. So basically, my my uh, my area that I purchase as a franchisor, franchisee, sorry, is um, is Vancouver Island, and I'm supposed to service the um, Sunshine Coast. Don't get a lot of calls. We don't do a lot of marketing there. It's sporadic. Um, Actually, our first uh, stair lift that I ever installed was in uh, Paul River there. So, um, but we don't get a lot of calls. So this is this is head office. So there's a corporate entity, and then there's the the, the franchise side of things. As I mentioned in 1993, Brian Clark, uh, uh, the original guy, that was the the he started with the ramp in 2004. He brought uh, his brother uh, um, Brian on on board for for helping out. 2007, his other brother. So you can see there's a little bit of a, a family uh, um, approach here. And, and that's sort of the way they approached it. And that was one of the things when I was doing my uh, due diligence and trying to find a business, that was one of the things that I, I liked is these guys are nice guys. Their intent is to help. Yes, they're, they're making money, but at the same time, they're also um, uh, in it for the right reasons. And I like that family approach, you know, in terms of, of um, of doing things. So in 2010, they basically uh, realized, you know, they had an opportunity to start something in terms of other medical equipment aside from ramps. And so the franchise model started. Um, first franchisee started in 2013. And as of uh, 2022, you're looking at 24 uh, uh, locations. Our motto is passion. We believe in what we're doing. We're trying to help people. Um, you know, it was a nice fit for me to, to progress from paramedicine and management to uh, to owning my own business in, in, in a related area that I, I saw a need. Um, and that's that's sort of the, the, the way I approach it with my staff. I want them to, to have passion and be dedicated and go that extra step with our clients. Be responsive. Not everything is going to be perfect. Sometimes we do get glitches in terms of equipment, installations, that kind of stuff. So we deal with that. Um, you know, I love building relationships. The fact that Lori asked me to do this, I came to the office and did a little dance, you know, because I, I really do believe that, you know, this is, this is how we work, is we work with, with partners in the field, OTs, uh, um, physios and that kind of stuff. And I'm always trying to find new, new opportunities to partner and, and, and build relationships. Of course, it's a huge, uh, a huge field and knowledge being knowledgeable is important so that we're not, uh, you know, pitching something that we don't, um, that isn't appropriate. And hopefully we get it. I think we do most of the time. All right. So some of the stuff, uh, aluminum uh, wheelchair ramps, like I said, that was the first thing, grab bars, stair lifts, elevators, VPLs, there's a whole array of different uh, types of products. Um, VPLs, uh, a lot of people aren't even aware of some of these uh, solutions. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that, but uh, a vertical platform lift is basically an open concept elevator that goes, that's outside, it's weatherproofed obviously for, for environments. And, and so that's great. Um, we do, we're getting into small one level elevators um, and our, our programs, we have sort of a, a, an approach where we, um, you know, it, it seems like a lot of times the people that need it the most can't afford it. They haven't planned for it. They haven't, you know, it sort of sneaks up on them. And all of a sudden, um, I, 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 I joke because I've been at, at, at uh, um, home shows and it's like people go by, by my booth or whatever and they go, not yet, not yet. And they go to the opposite side of the, of the path to avoid um, you know, it's, people deny, they don't want to admit that they need stuff. And then it's only in a crisis situation that they do that. And that presents a problem because a lot of times they need it and they can't afford it. They haven't planned accordingly. They haven't sort of prepared. And so um, we try to do a bit of rentals. We can't do everything in terms of rentals, but we do do straight uh, stair lift rentals and, and offer that in and along with the purchases of the aluminum wraps are a great product for rental purposes too. So I try to provide a little bit of that too. Okay, I think you already understand that I feel pretty passionate about our company and that we think we're uh, pretty good at what we do, but I'm not saying we're the only game in town. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about ramps. Um, you know, in terms of standards, people aren't even aware that uh, ramps are, are, they have to be up to a certain code. Um, I, I so often get, you know, somebody calling me and then all of a sudden they realize, you know, it's not that cheap. So they go and build their own ramp, but they don't do it a, a, appropriate in terms of the incline. So all of a sudden they've got a caregiver trying to push this wheelchair up the, the ramp and then the incline is too steep and too dangerous. You know, there, those rules are there to, to prevent injuries. And we talk about a one to 12 ratio. So for every inch of rise that you have to go up, there's supposed to be 12 inches uh, or a foot of, of ramp. So even that picture that you see there, it's not much of a, uh, an elevation there. But now you're looking at 14, 15 feet of ramp that's necessary to do the proper incline. And that, you know, two steps. I, I dealt with a client not too long ago that basically had been sort of house, uh, house prisoner for, for two years because of two steps. The house was, was a bungalow, beautiful, no problems, except both entrances had two steps. And that was enough of a barrier for her not to be able to go out on, on a regular basis. You know, so we try to try to promote the ramps because we know that is an excellent product that allows not only somebody to walk up, use a walker, wheelchair accessible. It's it's a it's a great product. With that, there's also commercial side, and then there's the the, the residential side. Um, we're starting to get a little bit more into the commercial side, but a lot of uh, companies, you know, uh, would rather do their own thing. And again. Um, our, our hope is that they're doing it appropriately with the right ratios and the right uh, incline. Our systems are modular. Um, so basically what you see there is different pieces all pieced together and we can build, we can turn, we can do a platform, we can do a whole bunch of different things to try and make it fit within uh, um, uh, the property there. You know, little threshold ramps, sometimes that, that barrier, you know, using a, um, a rubber uh, mat for a one and a half, uh, one and a half inch rise that in itself becomes a tripping barrier and stuff and those products are excellent to prevent that there's portable ramps that you can actually fold and and, and take and you know some people don't want to don't need it all the time or they don't want to have it, uh, a permanent ramp in, in their residence so there are products that are temporary that can help there are limitations with those but but again you know that's that's something that people aren't even aware of the process itself basically is I get a call, we go do a home uh, evaluation. Uh, most of the time it's just for that one product. I, I do promote OTs. I do talk about, you know, the fact that perhaps they need to, to look holistically at, at their whole situation and also look at where are they going to be, you know, five years from now, because the reality is a stair lift is great if you can ambulate enough to, to sit in it, but it's not going to be great if you're, you know, uh, conditions going to deteriorate and you're not going to have upper body strength to move and, and go into a, a stair lift. So those are different things, but, you know, we'll go in, do a review, provide a quote, a formal quote based on what we see, and hopefully they're interested. And if not, that's fine. But, but at, at that point we schedule, we install, and, and that's the process. Um, talked a little bit about vertical platform lifts and sequence of the ramps because, again, it's great. That 1 to 12 ratio is fantastic. But in most cases, you know, people have four or five steps. Well, an average step is about seven inches. When you start multiplying that by four steps, five steps, you're now into 20 plus 30 feet of ramp. A lot of properties, especially down, you know, smaller uh, uh, areas in mid-city, don't have the property the 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 uh, you know the space to put a big big ramp you know over 30 feet so how do we solve that well there's vertical platform lifts those are great again it allows somebody to use a walk or wheelchair go right up there and it's um it takes much less space obviously than than a, a 30 foot ramp okay so let's talk a little bit about stair lifts um most people, you know, when they look at their stairs, they're not even aware that, you know, um, you know, if it's a straight section, that's pretty straightforward. If it's curved, if it's got a, a landing halfway through, that then basically triples the cost. And now you're looking at a custom curved lift. You know, there's different products out there, but 
um, you know, that's that's the challenge. And sometimes um, we try to work with a client and, you know, in some situations, they're strong enough that they're able to um, move from one uh, straight section to another halfway and pivot and go on to another one. And it's still cheaper than than a curved lift. But that is one of the challenges that we have. Um, having said that, you know, stair lifts are not just an, an indoor solution. They can actually be used for steps outside too, because they are um, there are outdoor models. A little more expensive, but um, that becomes a solution there too. Um, there's again different products. Um, what I will say about this is, you know, um, whenever you get a custom job, usually, you know, it takes anywhere between four to eight weeks to get it manufactured, shipped and installed. Well, in a lot of instances, people need it, you know, next day kind of thing. So there are products. Um, one of them is uh, uh, the picture you see there. It's an up system. We can actually build the railings. It's very industrial looking, but we can actually build it on site. And the advantage to these units is that um, basically we can take it apart and it can be resold, whereas a custom is basically built for that one stairwell. Um, stair lifts are pretty straightforward. Um, when they first started building these uh, quite a few years before my time, uh, they basically would attach it to a wall. One of the problems is gravity and time, they would sag and there was a lot of issues. So now basically every stair lift that, um, that is out there that's a main seller is basically uh, the railing actually goes and attaches to the steps themselves. And basically the chair goes up and down and you know, if there's a power outage, uh, basically there's a, um, batteries within the system, so it keeps it charged, and so somebody's not going to get stuck halfway going up or down the steps. Um, these manufacturers, you know, they they build everything from a standard, you know, around 300 pound uh, stair lift to the heavy duty, uh, um, you know, for heavier individuals. Again, um, there's different different products for different uh, capacities, and uh, that's part of our our quote and our recommendations when we go in and and, and provide um, you know some feedback as to what would be appropriate for that individual. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, I mean, there's 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 a profile with the the, the stair lift when it's in, uh, deployed, and obviously when it's folded up. Um, 24 inches, we can basically move the really small stairwells, we can actually put one in there. Um, we did a, um, in a, a trailer, um, we actually put a, for two steps, we put a small little stair lift. It was about an inch of, of space between the deployment and, and the narrow pathway, but there are solutions. Um, again, that's what we do is we come in and we make recommendations on that. Again, process very similar to anything else. We come in, do a review, provide a quote, purchase, schedule this installation and provide that installation. And it can be done pretty quick uh, for straight sections. The industry is evolving and obviously as, as population ages, um, it's big business and there's new products. We um, we actually have this unit, it's called a lift to go. Um, and we actually have it in uh, our warehouse for rental purposes. Um, I've, I've uh, rented out a few times for graduations, for public uh, events. Um, it's a great tool for that. Also for temporary usage of somebody's um, post-op, you know, and, and has, uh, has a need for something, but doesn't want a permanent ramp, doesn't want a permanent uh, VPL, this is great because you just put it up there and it allows somebody to get in and out of the house. Elevators. <laughs> there are people who, um, again, as I said, from trade shows, I find that people uh, don't want to admit that they need certain pieces of equipment, um, the vanity factor. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, we're finding that more and more individuals that can afford it are opting for uh, one level elevators. Basically, it's a lift. It's like a VPL. And it's not a complex unit where you need a shaft and whatnot. We deal with Pollock uh, Home Lifts. They're a UK based company. And they look good. 
and it doesn't scream accessibility. It doesn't scream that uh, you know they they need a stair lift or whatever. It looks like a nice plush uh, product that you know meets their needs and allows them to go from one level to the next. Finally, um, you know we can talk about all these nice expensive pieces of equipment like elevators that cost you know forty plus thousand dollars, but the reality is and this is why I'm very passionate and I enjoyed Tanya's presentation is it's the little things. It's getting rid of those carpets. It's the, the grab bars. Those are the things that prevent injuries. And uh, we offer those as a service because again, we know that that's going to prevent falls and, and hopefully uh, keep somebody safe and longer in their home without uh, any complications. Okay. Simplest things have, have the biggest impact and fall prevention is one of those. That's my little presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions after everybody's done their thing. And uh, we're here in Langford. Uh, we service all of Vancouver Island. So give us a call. <laughs> Thanks, Al. I'm going to get you to close your uh, PowerPoint. And we're going to move on to um, Rachel next. And uh, as I mentioned, Rachel is uh, was raised in Machosan and she returned four years ago after raising her family in Vancouver and working as a nurse and nursing instructor in the area of mental health. And she now lives side by side with her 91 year old parents on the property she grew up on and they have um, modified uh, that property um, in order for the extended family to stay um, there, living there. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Rachel, and uh, you can tell us about um, your experience. Yeah. So I, I'm, yeah, what, um, I'm now the lived experience example of what Tanya, Tanya knows what that would mean, um, of what Tanya and Al have been talking about. Um, interesting enough, Tanya, I started my career at Vancouver General in the psych wards there. So I've worked with OTs and physios. Um, so our journey, uh, I, I have a healthcare background, so I knew what was going to be happening with my folks. My um, grandparents on one side lived a long time. And interesting enough, the house that I grew up in before my parents owned it, they bought in 72, uh, the family living there had an elderly aunt living with them. And they had a suite, again, one all level suite already in the place with a little small kitchen. And after that, um, after we kids grew up, my grandmother moved in and lived in that same suite for 17 years. So the property has the history of this. And uh, she lived there till she passed um, pretty much to the very end. And so uh, as a nurse, I knew what we were up against. My dad was in medics and he also had some idea. My mom was pretty clueless really about what it might mean. She was on the surprised end of what's involved in all of our journey right now. Um, and so th there are three of us, but I'm the oldest. Uh, my kids are raised and grown and I knew who as the healthcare provider would be uh, engaging with them. And uh, my sister lives back East. My brother's family is much younger. So um, we started having conversations because my dad always joked that the only way he's leaving that house is in a, a pine bat box or organic sack feet first. <laughs> and he um, really just wanted to live his life out there. And so uh, I was able, um, we are very lucky and very privileged. One, my husband never wants to retire. So I was actually able to retire a little early and to start doing this. So we sold our place in North Van and moved, moved over. And before we moved over, we built on an addition to accommodate two couples. And when we built that addition, everything we looked at was how to make it um, accessible for an older person. And uh, they're still quite comfortable on their side of the house with the stairs. So we also did modifications in that side of the house as well. And the stairs are great physio, get them going up and down those stairs, they get some exercise every day. But we've installed double banisters everywhere. Uh, we put in uh, no carrying laundry baskets down the stairs, they have a throw bag 
and then we toss them down the stairs. And uh, we've also got lots of help now in my, they have four hours of assistance every day for those kinds of tasks. And my dad's now in a situation where he needs some uh, hands-on care, um, getting him in the shower and things like that. So we're, we're, we've got, we feel a pretty good balance now, but it was a bit of a journey getting there. And they've had a long time housekeeper who now is willing to do a lot more work. So that those kinds of things are now in place. And my mother is the master at decluttering. She's very zen, so she's always getting rid of stuff. And we've rolled up the carpets, we've put the cords out of the way. And uh, so we've done all those kinds of things on their side. And so they're right now happy there. But eventually one, you know, both or one may not be. And so the plan will then be we swap sides. And so when we built the addition, uh, one of the bathrooms, uh, the, the main bathroom that we built, um, has a bench. I have photos, but I'm not going to fuss around with slides. We've seen enough slides right now, but it has a bench at one end and the controls are at the other end so that the person assisting with the shower can control what's happening with the shower at the end of the, the other person's there. The, the doorway in all through the, the suite is the standard uh, wheelchair accessibility. So you can turning radius is same within the rooms, the turning radius in the kitchen and the bathroom is such that you can maneuver equipment. In the bathroom, we left cupboards absent on one of the sinks. And uh, we didn't hadn't done that in the kitchen. Um, and the one thing we would do differently is we would provide some lower counter space. And that is a modification that going forward, we, we will do because I we realize it's my mom is five foot two. And, and she's already too small for many countertops and has always had a lower counter. So that, that's something we would adjust. But in that shower, there's the grab bars. Uh, we put the grab bars in all the bathrooms in the house as well. And uh, so, and the entranceway, same thing. It, it, it allowed for where there was an old porch to have a smooth flat come in from the garage right into the front door. And even out the back door, if necessary, there's a field out there, but there's, it's again, flat to easily put in more walkways and things that way to access from another side of the driveway if necessary. Um, and so, so we did all those things and, you know, so far it's working great. We're enjoying living on our side and, and, and we took over the other suite, took out the other kitchen, et cetera. So we've split the house. Um, so we did all those practical things and have taken care of all of them and it's working quite well. Um, and so, but the tie-ins with Tanya's presentation is we had a contractor, we had an architect who we worked with, who was familiar with this kind of situation. Um, we ended up, we bought the property in the house so that uh, going forward, I'll be hoping one of my children is going to do this for me. I have three of them, hopefully one will stand up. We, <laughs> but, or, you know, we have room for uh, a caregiver that we can install and things like that. So we're, we're really looking down the road um, in, in that regard. Um, and, uh, and then we live side by side and we each have our own space now, cause that's um, for anyone who's going to be in a caregiving situation, really important to have your own solitude. And part of why I'm in Hawaii right now is to have my break as it were. And um, so, it's good to have that and think about those kind of things because boundaries in these kinds of situations are, are very important. And then uh, both Tanya and Al alluded to the fact that people often don't recognize where it is they're heading. And one of the hardest things is to have that conversation. And that um, was more of a challenge again for my mom than my dad. Um, and so, but they're both quite willing to uh, recognize their own mortality. My mom jokes that, you know, if she dies tomorrow, no one's going to write in the obituary taken before her time. And so we we were able to have those conversations. And one of the things that really helped my mom, I know that came up in the previous discussion we had when my mom was on this uh, program, uh, a book called Being Mortal, which is invaluable place to have people read. It's a very small book. It's written by a physician you know, from the United States. Um, and he talks in it about the things you need to start thinking about. I can't remember his actual name at the moment, but it's, it's, it's a, a good little book. And he, he talks about the kinds of challenges and having those conversations with your parents uh, going forward, uh, the cost benefit of analysis of at, at what point it's good to stay in your home and make those modifications. And at what point that becomes 
no longer financially feasible. There's sort of a tipping point there. And it's, you know, obviously different for different people, depending on what's going on with them. So to start having those conversations with my mom because, um, and dad, and my mom's fear was loss of independence, you know, having her bossy daughter next door telling her about what she needs to do in her house or, you know, whatever. Um, so it, it, uh, it was an evolution that took place over a, a few years and, um, and came, it worked out. So, uh, you know, so, so far, so good. And, uh, so it's yeah an interesting journey, and then I'm there, you know, eleven months of the year, <laughs> um, to offer assistance with appointments, driving to appointments. Because I'm chosen, of course, one of the big challenges for people aging in place is driving. There's really no transportation system that's you know uh, consistent. Uh, taxis, they often don't show up. You know, you're expecting them to come and they don't come. It's got much better over the years, but there is those kind of transportation infrastructure. So for aging in place, it's important to think about all those supports. And as Tanya mentioned, all those people who are in your life that can help you be there for going forward. And yeah, and I think that's really all I have to say. I, I um, for those who live in the chosen, if they want to see anything we've done, uh, one, of, one of the things that didn't come up with that is uh, door handles, for instance. All the door handles we put mm -hmm. in the house are the lever kind, the kind the bears can open in Whistler, but uh, so that you don't have to grab and turn. So you just pump it down or up. And so every door handle in, in the suite we built is as of a, that nature. So again, it was really simple things. And uh, yeah, so. Oh, yeah. oh, actually, yeah, and the other thought. So uh, also tying in with Al's presentation about if you're getting motorized equipment, we have a generator. My parents installed it years ago. So we have a generator so that we can keep these 91 year olds warm because they're cold all the time. And so one of the other things we installed uh, is a propane fireplace, took out the wood burning because that's a safety hazard for all sorts of reasons. And now all my mom has to do is flip a switch and she's got a nice warm fire. And uh, so you know, lots of different ideas around that, but a, a generator in the chosen is <laughs> always a good idea, you know, to think about. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Rachel. Gosh, all of you guys, those are wonderful. And before we just move on to uh, the question period, I just want to mention uh, one of the programs we offer at the Seniors Resource Center is it's called the Better at Home Program. And so if um, you are unable to drive, um, we provide drives to medical appointments or for groceries. We have a team of volunteers who will do that, and it's by donation. So. Um, Awesome. Um, yeah, I am going to open up the floor now to uh, anybody who has questions. Just feel free to, you can either just unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat and I can read it out. I think Jeanette there, I think has frozen up. I'm not sure if you have a question, Jeanette. One of our bedrooms recently was we, we lowered our, or we raised the outlets in the wall to 18 inches from 12 inches. And we lowered the light switches to being at a sort of, wheelchair or or uh, walker level and the thermostat in the room is, is lowered as well so even though we don't need those things right now we're just as we're going through the house we're gradually kind of doing those things as we go and um, I, I thought it was really interesting for Al to present some of the um, the, the really convenient lifts and even the uh, elevator idea elevator ideas anyway one of the questions I have is uh, with EB, our new premier, and his uh, his uh, campaign for increasing housing in the area, I wonder how many people there are in Machosen who would jump on um, a way, a method of creating a living 
age in place for themselves and thereby um, releasing some housing for other people, whether it be a caregiver right now, probably not at this stage in their life. But I just think that there's there's some awareness that could take place in people that are aging. Um, most people think they can't afford it. And I just wonder if there's anything in the political arena that could come forward as far as, as that goes. I know there was a few resources that um, Tanya mentioned, like BC, RAHA and Government of Canada tax deductions and so on. But I think most people see it as a financial obstacle to modify their homes or even like what we you know what Rachel's done. That, that's awesome. But I don't think a lot of people could afford it, especially yeah. Yeah. when no, they're on it's, pension. It's a real privilege. Yeah. When they're on, and then when they're pensioned. Um, another question I have too is um, how are, if, if a person did hire an OT, that's a, that's a, a private expense, I would imagine. Um, but some healthcare plans cover OTs. Do you know how they would be covered? Go ahead. It depend, yeah, so it is, it is one of those, it depends. So um, some extended health plans uh, will cover occupational therapy, either through, uh, it's very few, we'll do it very directly and name occupational therapy. <laughs> uh, others will, may have that, you know, the spending bucket or that discretionary kind of chunk that you can put towards allied health uh, but like you say largely a lot of it is private mm -hmm. um, pay so and the running rate for an occupational therapist according to kind of the our basic fee survey is around 120 dollars an hour right now um, so it is for sure and then just to kind of touch on your other questions questions and comments around yeah I mean you're speaking my one of my <laughs> career love languages of if we can shift some of this around to, so that people people who, who can can age in place and that there's funding and policy to support that then that will open up other housing spaces and also be able to redirect money uh, more appropriately in the long-term care settings because there's still a certain part of the population where you need to have access to those kinds of medical beds. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if there was more money per one of those medical beds because more people were able to stay at home. So that is kind of, that's the burning question right now out there. Other jurisdictions, so the UK uh, has much better funding policies around helping people remain at home. Um, and there's for disability and aging. Australia's got some. Um, BC is kind of a, the lead right now um, with the, this Raha program revision that they did uh, out of the Canadian provinces, but some of the other ones are going to be following suit, I think. Um, it's not enough, but it's a start. And, you know, I've done a few of those ones, renovations, and the, the limit is 17.5 is what you can get, get back. Um, for these renovations, which obviously I saw Rachel smirk. <laughs> it's not a lot. It really takes a lot of creative juices on our part when we're doing the some of the assessment stuff. But, um, you know, it can get the basics, the very basics done um, for people who are really living on the edge of safety. So it's a start. Where, and I, I just to add because and then it's everyone for themselves the 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 connect between what the government is saving by assisting people to stay longer in their home. Yes, totally. And and, and their willingness to transfer that money from the institutions to the community. And we yes. saw this in mental health when they sent everyone out, and all this money was going to go there. And of course, it never shows up because you know the, the, their political cycles. So it, it it's it's prevention. It's just something we just don't do. And, okay. and so those of us who are trying to do this are going to be pioneering this at our, our own expense and okay. saving the government that money with, with no recognition from them that, you know, if they did something meaningful, it, it could, could uh, help everyone all around, including the taxpayer. For sure. And that's driving some of the research that I want to do is that I, when you look around, the gap, that's the gap. There's no... Yeah. There's no data that says this is, you know, this bed costs this much. This is how much is saved to be able to show the governments what's going on yeah. and how it can be cheaper. Yeah, they're always I'm just better. happy to take the burden to, to, yeah. to families, you know, if they wherever exactly. they can. Exactly. And the, and the stress associated with you know change at 
you know, when you've been in a home for 35 years and all of a sudden now you're in a, you know, senior care home, I, there's so many different levels and impacts that, that happen <clears throat> that people would benefit from staying at home, not just monetary, but also on the other side, but of course, money. All of the social soft. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 COVID has made that readily apparent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stay yeah. home. It's a much better option. Something that I've learned, I've noticed too, Jeanette, is while the OT cost um, can be, you know, you we're Canadians, we don't love paying for our health care <laughs> front. So, but one of the things that I have seen is, you know, you go and spend 120 or 240 bucks for an hour or two of an OT's time to look around and give you a list of what is and isn't needed. I, I really believe you can save, um, from trying to muddle through on your own <laughs> or with some time like horror stories most i think all most contractors now are, are doing pretty good work but there's still going to be the odd time where people come in and try to you know they sell you the world but it doesn't actually deal with the one little thing that you needed help with and that couple hundred bucks on the ot assessment would nip that in the bud before you um, go and spend the big bucks on mm -hmm. something that doesn't help yeah. Oh, back to OT and payment. So it, the only time I can see that a healthcare plan would cover an OT is if the physician recommended that the OT be consulted rather than a, a kind of a, this is my, my image of it. It would be that proactively, it would be best to have an OT assess things and make a plan with you before anything happens. But I, sure. I can see from a physician's point of view, that a person wouldn't even necessarily go to their physician and ask for that referral until they were in the dire situation and needed needed that. So how does that, how so can a person go, proactively use the services of an OT with their healthcare plan, their extended so health plan? We're standalone. If, if it is covered, it's covered. You don't need the physician. You don't need a note. Really? Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, so and also, we, we've had a, an assessment from Island Health's OT with yes. my parents. Uh, so that's available. My dad is under the long-term care program now. Um, and so for him, but, but that's late in the game, right? That, that, yeah, that's once you're in. Yeah. There are some available like that. that are covered, but it is limited. And, uh, but, you know, if, if, if necessary. So, yeah. Yes, for sure. Once you get to crisis, kind of a bit of a crisis experience, then you can, you may be able to access through the public system, yeah. the community home health OTs. Um, typically that's to make sure that they're keeping you out of acute or bringing you out of acute care um, and keeping you home and safe. Yeah. So, so I hate to belabor the point of finances and all that all the time, but to, I know that, that that's prohibiting people from moving forward with things that they might like to. I just want to ask Al, um, do you know how Veterans Affairs um, can help members who or members who live in their own home still? Yeah, we this last year we were uh, we started dealing with Veterans Affairs and actually getting funding from them. Um, it, it's <clears throat> Veterans Affairs. My experience is, you know, um, they prolong the process. It's it's almost like, you know, um, a challenge for situations where somebody needs it quickly. It, it takes a long, a long time. Um, I, I, you know, I I started. I I, I was at the uh, OT conference in Whistler this last year, um, Tanya, and um, that's when I met the. Um, uh, the OT responsible for Vancouver Island for the uh, for Veterans Affairs and whatnot, and one one of the things that she was really excited about was is you know the rental programs. Why? Because a lot of times, again, as as bad as it sounds, you know some of these veterans don't have a a lot of years to to, to live, right? And sometimes it's months and whatnot. And so, from from Veterans Affairs perspective, they don't want to invest, you know. Uh, 15 grand on a, a custom stair lift and whatnot. So they're looking for quick, easy, uh, cheap solutions for those months. And so rental programs is something that, that, that they look at and, and provide. So rental um, is much easier to get 
you know, opportunities. Unfortunately, you know, from a business side of things, you got to worry about cash flow and how much inventory do you have tied up and, yeah. and rental and all that fun stuff from a business side. But it is something that I, I'm trying to build on because I do see that being a potential mini solution for, for those, those individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, we're at about uh, over the hour mark, but if there's uh, if there's another question, we and you guys have a bit more time, Tanya and Al and Rachel, we can keep going. Um, is, are there any other questions? I just appreciate the the presentation by everybody. I I know I'm speaking. I hope I'm not over speaking anyone else who wants to ask a question, but been really good information and appreciate Lori for sponsoring it thank you no no yeah um yes and, you know Rachel I might take you up on coming to see your place absolutely see absolutely you've yeah, done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no it's fine Lori has my email and she can give it <laughs> yeah. out yeah. we might we <laughs> might arrange a tour <laughs> yeah because <laughs> yeah. 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 They're, they're, yeah so yeah and we're continuing to improve on it as we go yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, thank well, you everybody. I'm gonna sign out now. Thanks, Jeanette. And you're welcome. Um, it doesn't seem like we have any other questions. So I'm gonna thank our panel for this. It was such a, a wealth of information and expertise. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this presentation. And I'll post the resources and the video on our website. Um and um yeah, and I think. Um, other than that, there if uh, who's left, Barbara and uh, the uh, Bruce and Kathy and Jeanette, if you'd like to fill out a survey, it's in the chat box. And okay. um, I will. yeah, and if you have suggestions for future events, we'd love to hear from you. So thank, thank you, everyone. And, I, I just um, sorry, sorry as an as an aside, I I wonder if Al might um might be interested in having a little show or something in the in the school parking lot when the weather gets nice of some of the products that he has oh a show and tell yeah molly's i was just asked actually at the base here for squimal to, to do to be part of that too yeah. so yeah i'm happy always to participate i mean it's it's all about promoting the industry and hopefully it benefits but at the same time it's 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 something we want to do and and yeah. also like the university has some really wonderful um accessibility um i'm trying to remember is it um it's ability 411 and they also it's called um um can assist through the university they've developed all kinds of products uh aimed specifically for disabilities and aging they would be wonderful i tried to get them on here but i never i wasn't able to um uh pull that off but maybe if we do do something in person it would be great if they could come and show do some show and tell as well yeah. yeah, and I'm, I'm and sure Tanya has, Tanya has several things that she could show as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I would just encourage you, and you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say. That even though it's it seems to be expensive, it that it just the cost of not doing these things it yeah. is worth. Yeah, right? in some ways, yeah, you you can say almost say you can't afford not to. Yeah. In some ways, and because, yeah. you know, and it, there's different ways of doing it. So, you know, because if yeah. it, my parents were just staying in their house on their side, it, it, that wasn't extravagant, making the space they're living in now, other than stairs would be an issue at some point. But yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. would say leaving with a nugget, too, of that point of as soon as you start to just have that tiny little seed of a question in your head that like, hmm, this isn't how it used to be that's when you should start looking around. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we'll end on that note. Thank you, everyone. And, um, and uh, stay well. Okay, okay. great. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.